Well, good morning, everyone. It's excellent to see you all Sunday morning, tuning in on the stream from home or wherever you are. Praise the Lord for staying interconnected over the internet. So first, I just want to say that this teaching this Sunday morning was given to Pastor Barbara by God, and I'm just giving the message on her behalf. So this is her teaching, and I just want to clarify that up front. So Father, we thank you. God, we give you all the honor and glory for the anointing that is on this teaching. We thank you, God, for your plan and purpose, your will in this teaching for your people. We just pray the Holy Spirit and the shed blood of Jesus Christ over this message, over each person watching and listening. And we thank you, God, that your holy angels are going to and fro where everyone is at to minister to our spirit, to our hearts, that all that you plan and purpose, God, will come to full fruition within us and affect positively those in our sphere of influence. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name, amen. When Pastor Barbara asked God what he wanted taught for the service, he stated, when you have the bull by the horns and don't know what to do with him, a very interesting statement. Now, how many times have you had the bull by the horns or the enemy and didn't know what to do with him? This is an excellent question to reflect on. In the book of Mark, chapter six, verse one, it says, then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him, talking about Jesus. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Is this not brother and sister so-and-so? Are they not related to these people? <laughs> Verse four, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. This is very profound. It sums up the whole principle that a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. We have all experienced this at some level or another where you are not honored in your own home or your family or in your circle of friends. Jesus went through this first and foremost. He completely understands and he's teaching us this for various reasons. The summary here is that God has a plan. No matter what we go through and no matter what we face, we must never be found not believing in God for the miracle. Everything we've been going through here in recent times, particularly the last couple of weeks, should have driven us to a place where we can stand in that principle, where we can stand on a secure foundation where we will never be found not believing God for the miracle. We should always be believing God for the miracle despite what people around about us might say or do, despite what the enemy is throwing at us, we should be strong and secure knowing that God has a plan and a purpose for everything that we're going through. This sermon deals with having faith right to the end, taking the bull by the horns and not letting go kind of faith. It reminds me of Jacob wrestling with the angel. He would not release that angel and refuse to let go until that angel blessed him. And that angel even dislocated his hip joint. 
popped his bones right out of his socket to try to stop him, but he never let go. Same principle. We need to be the same way. Grabbing the bull by the horns. Again, in the book of Luke, chapter 9, starting at verse 10. When the apostles came back, they told Jesus what they had done on their trip. Then he took them away to a town called Bethsaida. There, he and his apostles could be alone together. That sounds nice. But verse 11. But the people learned where Jesus went and followed him. He welcomed them and talked with them about God's kingdom. He healed the people who were sick. See, Jesus didn't turn these people away. Even though his intention was to have the apostles or disciples by, by himself with them, the people found him and they started flooding in and he welcomed them all. And after he welcomed them, he started talking to them about the kingdom of God and even healing people. This is exactly what we need to do. In the same way, we may have an, a, a plan, we may have a preconceived idea or an agenda, but if the Holy Spirit wants to do something different, then we have to welcome that and embrace it and flow with the Holy Spirit and what he desires to do. And this is an excellent opportunity to share with other people our testimonies, to teach them about the things that God has done for us to give them hope and to inspire them also. Continuing in verse 12, late in the afternoon, the 12 apostles came to Jesus and said, no one lives in this place. Send the people away. <laughs> I don't think they understood. <laughs> they need to find food and places to sleep in the farms and towns around here. But Jesus said to the apostles, you give them something to eat. They said, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Do you want us to go buy food for all these people? There are too many. There were about 5,000 men there. Jesus said to his followers, tell the people to sit in groups of about 50 people. So the followers did this and everyone sat down. Then Jesus took the five loaves of bread and two fish. He looked up into the sky and thanked God for the food. Then he broke it into pieces, which he gave to the followers to give to the people. They all ate until they were full. And there was a lot of food left. Twelve baskets were filled with the pieces of food that were not eaten. That's a whole lot of leftovers, man. That's the miracle work and power of God right there. The disciples had the bull by the horns, but what were they to do? They were to feed the people. See, they had a, a situation where all these people needed to be fed. And obviously, you weren't going to have enough money to go out and buy and do it the normal way. This was a perfect opportunity for Jesus to show his miraculous power. And he wanted the disciples included in this. He wanted them to be a part of this. They had the bull by the horns, but they didn't exactly know what to do. And this is the point of this teaching. How many times have we had the bull by the horns and we're standing there wrestling this thing and we're like, well, I have them, but I don't know exactly what to do. <laughs> That's happened quite a few times with, with me personally, and I'm sure with many of you also. So this is why we need to think about this and reflect. And in this particular situation, when they had the bull by the horns here, the, the point to defeat this enemy was to utilize that miraculous power to feed the people. And they did. James chapter four, verse seven. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You have the bull by the horns. What are you to do? Keep yourself free from all sin and darkness. This is the ultimate summation. 
this is our direct command from God here. When we have a place or a moment in our lives when we are confronting the enemy, that we are grabbing that enemy by the horns, the one thing that we must make sure that we do is to keep ourselves free from all sin and darkness. Because when you entertain sin, when you dabble in the darkness, you lose your holding power. You are no longer able to hold on to the enemy's horns. And those horns will pierce you and they will set you back. They can cause you to stumble and fall. They can cause you to lose what God has already given you if you dabble in that darkness or if you entertain that sin. This is why it is so important and critical. It's like the prime directive. We have to keep ourselves free from all sin and darkness. Now, there is a book that is called Soul Keeping by John Ortberg. Ortberg opens up the book with the following allegory, which is used throughout the book. And he says it this way. There once was a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were as old as the earth and as deep as the sea. The water was clear like crystal. What a beautiful place. Children laughed and played beside it. Swans and geese swam on it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills, far beyond anyone's sight, lived an old man who served as keeper of the springs. He had been hired so long ago that now no one could remember a time that he wasn't there. He would travel from one spring to another in the hills, removing branches or fallen leaves or debris that might pollute the water. But his work was unseen. One year, the town council decided they had better things to do with their money. No one supervised the old man anyway. They had roads to repair and taxes to collect and services to offer. And giving money to an unseen stream cleaner had become a luxury they could no longer afford. So the old man left his post. High in the mountains, the springs went unattended. Twigs and branches and worse muddied the liquid flow. Mud and silt compacted the creek bed. Farm wastes turned parts of the stream into stagnant bogs. For a time, no one in the village noticed. But after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live elsewhere. The water was no longer having a crisp scent that drew children to play by it. Some people in the town began to grow ill. All noticed the loss of sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the streams that fed the town. The life of the village depended on the stream and the life of the streams depended on the keeper. The city council reconvened. The money was found. The old man was rehired. After yet another time, the springs were cleaned. The stream was pure. Children played again on its banks. Illness was replaced by health. And swans came home and the village came back to life. The life of the village depends on the health of the stream. The stream is your soul and you are the keeper. Let's hear that again. The life of the village depends on the health of the stream. The stream is your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, and you are the keeper. Question, how would you describe your current soul maintenance program? Think about that. Do you have a soul maintenance program? 
What are you doing each and every day to check with yourself that your soul is in balance with the word of God, with the will of God? Is the desires, are the desires of your soul lined up with the intentions and the desires of the Holy Spirit? Even just asking yourself these questions every day is a soul maintenance program. And you have the responsibility as the keeper of your soul, the keeper of your stream, to think about these things, to make sure that you are being lined up and are being well balanced in your soul. Question. On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the healthiest, how would you rate the health of your soul? We need to reflect and just be honest about this because some days, sometimes, you may not get such a great score. Things happen in our lives every day, some worse than others, and it can really affect our soul. And God understands when we go through those moments God understands when we have those down times, but there's also an expectation that even as we're going through that, we still have to be the keeper of our stream. We still have to have an active soul maintenance program that we're working with and dealing with, even in those moments. And that is what pleases God when he sees that we are desperately trying, even though we're struggling, even though we're suffering at times, to do what he has put in us to do, what he has taught us to do. Beyond that, the soul seeks to connect us with other people, with creation, and with God himself, who made us to be rooted in him the way a tree is rooted by a life-giving stream. Trees grow by streams and the roots of those trees actually absorb water from the stream the roots go deep into the ground and not only do they go deep but they also spread out wide this is evidenced by times you may see a a giant tractor trailer semi truck plowing into a tree on the side of the road And that tree doesn't budge, doesn't go anywhere. And the tractor trailer semi, all that many tons of steel is all twisted and wrapped around the tree because the tree was stronger than the truck, even though it was moving at 70 miles an hour, because the roots, it's all about the roots. They go so deep into the ground and they spread so wide that it's like an immovable fortress. That tree cannot be moved. And this is exactly how we are to be in in Christ. If our roots are deep and wide in Christ, then we can't be moved. No matter what comes at us, no matter what force or what object tries to, to dislodge us, to uproot us, or to move us in any fashion, it won't work. This is the importance of having strong, healthy roots, drawing off of that healthy stream that's clean and pure. When we keep our lives free from sin and darkness, we have full access to that clean, healthy stream of water, which provides the the root system and the foundation that we need in Christ to move forward in the way that God wants us to. We just need to be like trees. It's that simple. So I'll say this again. Beyond that, the soul seeks to connect us with other people, with creation, and with God himself, who made us to be rooted in him the way a tree is rooted by a life-giving stream. The word soul in both the Old Testament and New Testament and elsewhere in the ancient world is often simply a synonym for the person. In other words, your soul is what integrates your will or your intentions, your mind, your thoughts, and your feelings, 
your values, your conscience, and your body, your face, your body language, your actions, all of these things are just combined into a single life. So when we say the word soul, we're basically talking about a person, all of their intentions, their feelings, their thoughts, their values, their conscience, their body language, their actions. That's what we're talking about. A soul is healthy or well-ordered when there is harmony between these three entities and God's intent for all creation. When you are connected with God and other people in life, you have a healthy soul. There is a common misconception among some people that, well, as long as I'm okay with God, then I'm okay. I don't believe that's true because it's good to be close to God and to be right with him. But to end it there is like putting a a bowl over your lamp. It's like you're burying your talents and you're not using them. God wants us to remove that bowl, to be in right standing with him, to be close to him, but then to influence other people, to draw them to Christ, that the light in us, our testimony, can be shared with other people around us so that they can know God as we have come to know God. And that's what's so important. That's where the harmony and the balance is when you take what you have, what God has given you, and you share this with other people and you give the experience that you have to other people. When you make those sacrifices, those investments, when you're obedient to doing what God is asking or telling you to do, when you step out by faith and you do those things in the spirit, you are giving of yourself to other people as others have given of themselves to you. And this is the harmony, this is the balance that God is talking about here. And that's what makes it so important to not only have as much of God in you as you can, but also to be pouring that out and sharing that with anybody in your sphere of influence, just out with the world to anyone that will listen and to the people that God sends to you. Question, is John's explanation of the soul and how it relates to your body, mind, and will a clear and compelling explanation? Those are the things we were talking about earlier. When you have your body, your mind, and your will working together towards the will of God, working together to be lined up with the word of God, your three-part being, your body, soul, and spirit, is then working together, not against each other, but working together to fulfill the plans and purposes that God has through you each and every day. And we need to look at each and every day as a canvas, as a foundation or a template that God wants to use to do something through us or with us. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in life just everyday things, our own agendas, plans, whatever it may be, that we tend to miss God a lot of the time because our mind, our will, our emotions are not entirely balanced. Our body, soul, and spirit may not be working together in harmony. So when that happens, we may miss opportunities that God wants to do different things through us to help and influence other people. So as part of our soul maintenance program that we talked about earlier, it would be very wise and beneficial to incorporate in that soul maintenance program just a little check at the beginning of the day. God, whatever canvas you have for me today, I pray that when you paint that picture, you would open my eyes to see what opportunities will exist today 
for me to be used by you in whatever way to accomplish the purpose you have, whether it be ministering to somebody, maybe just giving someone a word of encouragement, perhaps even just sharing a testimony with someone or posting something online just for others to see that God is good and he is real, that he can be trusted. Let them see what God has done for you in your life and go from there. That could be maybe the one thing that God wants to do with you that day. So incorporate that in your soul maintenance program and try it out. And I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit will definitely move in a situation like that. Question, how well integrated are you? Are there any changes you need to make to your daily life to help you become more integrated? Well, we just sort of talked about that. Check and analyze your soul maintenance program. How deep, how involved are you in the things of the spirit? And just meditate on the spirit. Spend time in the presence of God. Even if it's only for a couple minutes, wake up in the morning, thank God for the day. Just pray, just talk to him. I talk to God just like a regular person while I'm walking around and doing things in the morning. And this is how it, this is how it can be. It's, it's not a religious thing. It's, it's a relationship thing. And many of you do the same thing. Just talk to God and just open your heart. Ask him to open your eyes. You may or may not hear anything and that's okay. But as long as you're open, as you're doing things throughout the day, the Holy Spirit can just whisper to you. God can all of a sudden just start talking to you right in the middle of doing anything or maybe in the middle of doing nothing. Just listen for God and he'll come to you. In a section entitled Unhealthy Souls, John reflected on a businessman he knew who devoted his life to, to making money. His children always knew that they had less priority than his job. He then quoted Jesus' statement, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? John then stated, I have always thought this verse meant that in the long run, it won't do you any good to acquire a lot of money and have a lot of sex and other sensual pleasures if you end up going to hell. John writes, Dallas gently corrected me. That is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not talking here about people going to hell. Now this is very interesting. He explained that Jesus is talking about a diagnosis, not a destination. Acquiring the whole world could not even produce satisfaction, let alone meaning and goodness. To lose my soul means I no longer have a healthy center that organizes and guides my life. That is the human problem. It is not some superficial thing that only relates to getting the right afterlife if you affirm the right doctrines. Let's read that again. To lose my soul means I no longer have a healthy center that organizes and guides my life. That is the human problem. It is not some superficial thing that only relates to getting the right afterlife if you affirm the right doctrines. It has to do with the depth of the human conditions, which Jesus identified as nobody else ever has. Jesus identified with the human condition. He knew exactly what it was like to be 100% fully human. He understands our struggles, our weaknesses, he went through everything that you and I go through as fully human. He also lived as fully God, but he totally understands having lived as fully human also. All of our shortcomings, all of our conditions, 
but he still made it through and persevered in those conditions as pure and holy. In his book, Soul Keeping, John Ortberg tells about (laughs) riding a mechanical bull at a street fair. The bull operator explained that the bull had 12 levels of difficulty and that Pastor Ortberg's best bet for not getting bucked off was to shift his center of gravity to match the bull's movements. Now, I have to tell you here, this is an excellent, excellent teaching. This point that's being made here is telling us that when the enemy comes after us and we take that enemy, the bull by the horns, or perhaps we're even riding that mechanical bull, the best way to maintain a stance and a posture of victory is to be able to have that well-balanced, well-rounded soul nature to be flowing in the spirit, to have a well-roundedness of common sense and, and many other positive quality attributes from God to be able to shift your center of gravity, to shift and move your weight, to roll with the punches, so to speak, to flow with the Holy Spirit, I should say, and to stay on top of that enemy, to stay on top of that bull so that he is always underneath your feet and God will give you the killing blow. God will give you the wisdom and the instruction of how to strike the final blow against that enemy to defeat him once and for all. But in order to hear those instructions, in order to carry out that death blow, so to speak, we have to be well-rounded and balanced. Body, soul, and spirit, mind, will, and emotions. And remember, how do we do this? We have to do this by keeping all sin and darkness out of our lives. Living in holiness and walking in total unconditional love is the only way that we're gonna be able to do this. We have to walk in the spirit and we have to do these things that God is teaching us to do. When we grab the bull by the horns, as uh, John Ortberg said in his book and as Pastor Barbara explained so well in her teaching, when we do this, we can have the victory. The victory is already there. We just have to take the bull by the horns and listen for God for that killing strike to destroy the enemy of our souls. Think about it. Everything we've been through in these last few weeks has been uh, an onslaught of the enemy. And he has tried so desperately to derail us, to take us off course, to do anything to take us down, to separate us from the body of Christ, to separate us from each other, the congregation. But he failed. He completely failed because we are staying together. We are connected. We are fellowshipping with each other in ways that we didn't realize before. We're utilizing new methods and strategies to reach out to each other. And this is all the plan and design of God. And it's working. The Holy Spirit is reaching out through the airwaves. It's going over the internet. Everybody is being fed. They're being encouraged. People are sharing their testimonies. The the devil failed. He made a huge mistake in trying to attack all of us like this because all he did was (laughs) enable God to bring us closer together, to stay even more connected, but just through different avenues we have successfully taken the bull by the horns and we have triumphed over the enemy through Christ because we stayed connected. We stayed connected to God. We stayed close to the source. And when things were so bad in our lives that perhaps we even felt like we were down for the count or maybe we felt like we just wanted to give up, but we didn't because God was right there the whole entire time telling us there is a plan, there is a purpose. You shall live and not die. 
you will make it through this. God even explained to some of us, you weren't exactly where I needed you to be at. So I brought you through this, this trial, this adversity, knowing that you had the victory. And as you walked that out, as you went through that, you became so much stronger because of what you endured. And now you are a stable, well-rounded warrior that can now grab the bull by the horns and take the enemy out in your life. This is what God has been trying to do with each one of us, is to strengthen and equip us and to teach us how to do these things, how to conquer the enemy of our soul. How, and while we're doing that, also how to uplift each other and to encourage one another, even when we're going through our own battles. And this is what it's all been about. Jesus went through so many of his own personal battles. He was constantly being fought. I mean, constantly, just read the word. But even through that, he taught others. He shared with them about the kingdom of God. He healed them. He performed so many signs, wonders, and miracles, despite what was going on within himself at times. He laid his life down truly and put down his own personal affairs and took care of the people. And he still does this today as he takes care of you and I. And this is the message that God wants for each one of us, for all of his people, is that you do have the victory and you do have the bull by the horns. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Think about this. Get closer to God and share your testimonies. Be lights that can draw others to Christ. Father, we thank you for this timely message. We thank you for giving this wisdom and instruction to Pastor Barbara. God, we give you all the honor and glory for the plans and the purposes that you have through this teaching for each one of us, for all your people. God, this is such a, a rich, ripe time and season in your kingdom. And the glory, God, is just right there. The anticipation, the excitement, the defeat of the enemy and the glorious victory that you have provided for your children, which is right here, right now. We just thank you for it, God. We thank you for the total rebound of the children of God. We, think, we thank you, God, and give you all honor and glory. Thank you that your holy angels are securing the word in the shed blood of Jesus into each one of our hearts. That your, your teaching here, God, will bear so much good fruit for your kingdom. We thank you, God, and we praise you continually for all that you have done for us for all that you continue to do with us, God. We praise you. You are the true most high God. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for tuning in this Sunday morning. We wanna thank you and we will see you again tonight for another service at the Lighthouse Church over the Facebook and the streaming. Thank you and God bless.